I can't imagine how you can wake up in the morning, have a good time together, go to work and ruin your whole marriage in a couple of hours. It's both amazing and very terrible. Cheating is the most insidious thing that can happen in a marriage. And the most unpleasant thing is that no one is immune from it. When I woke up, there was no sign of trouble. The alarm went off at five and my wife Diana pulled me back into bed when I tried to get up. She kissed me and hugged me. Even after 25 years, she was still attractive and I wanted to be intimate with her. After that, she went to make coffee while I was taking a shower, and then I made breakfast while she was taking a shower. Over the meal, we discussed our plans for the day, and Diana suggested meatloaf and baked potatoes for dinner. It sounds tempting. I'll get some fresh French bread and maybe a pecan pie from the bakery, I replied. Pecan pie? You spoil me, she teased. I wouldn't want to spoil anyone else, I said kissing her as we walked hand in hand to the garage before breaking up and starting our day at work. The journey in was without incident, as was the first part of the morning. Around 11, Harry, my boss, summoned me to his office. We've got a situation in St. Louis. Baker found Smithers with his wife, and now Baker's in jail while Smithers is in the hospital. There's no one to manage the office there. I hate to spring this on you at short notice, but you need to catch the 220 flight, get to St. Louis, and take charge of the office. I'm unsure how long you'll need to stay. It depends on the severity of the situation between Baker and Smithers. If it's bad, Baker might be in jail for a while, and Smithers might be in the hospital for some time too. Even if they're both out soon, I can't see how they could work together. I'll have to think carefully, but it seems inevitable that one of them will have to go. I'm not sure which one. I'll need more information before deciding. It appears straightforward to me. Smithers crossed a line by getting involved with Baker's wife. He should have anticipated Baker's reaction if he ever found out. I can't confirm if Baker actually caught Smithers with his wife, or if Smithers is guilty at all. All I know is what the secretary told me over the phone. Perhaps you can gather more details once you're there. I tried calling Diane to update her, but her secretary informed me she was in a meeting. I promised to call back later, and then went home to pack. When I arrived home I noticed Diane's car parked in the driveway, which struck me as odd since she was supposed to be in a meeting. Upon entering the living room I confirmed that she was indeed in a meeting, although not the type I had anticipated based on what her secretary had informed me. A path of discarded clothing scattered on the floor caught my attention leading from the couch to the staircase. Among them were men's garments, including a pair of trousers at the bottom of the stairs. As I retrieved them, I discovered a wallet nestled in one of the back pockets. Upon inspecting its contents, I learned the name Stanton North from the driver's license. I slipped the wallet into my pocket and proceeded to scan the room where I spotted a sweet coat draped over the back of an armchair. Investigating further, I uncovered a checkbook, which I also pocketed. As I was climbing the stairs and approaching the top, I heard sounds coming from the bedroom. Do this to me, quickly. Do you like it? Oh, yes, go on. When I entered the room, I saw how my faithful wife had been cheating on me for many years in our bedroom, and all this was accompanied by very insulting words. Don't stop, she said as I passed by, heading for the closet. I was almost at the closet door when Stanton North noticed me and stopped abruptly, exclaiming, Oh, shit! Diana was sitting with her eyes closed, and apparently she was at a loss when her lover suddenly froze. Don't stop. Damn it. Don't stop. I'm almost... Then she saw me and screamed, No. Oh, God, no, trying to get out from under North. I won't be long, I said, entering the dressing room. I just need to pack my bag and then I'll leave you lovebirds alone. When I took socks and underwear out of the dresser and put them in the suitcase, I stood with my back to them, but their voices could be heard in the air. Diana's voice was pleading, Get the hell away from me! While North muttered, God, what a mess! As I turned to get a bag of clothes from the closet, I saw North coming out of the bedroom and Diana trying to hide. Among her convulsive movements, she uttered phrases such as, What are you doing, Frank? Why are you packing? and meaningless explanations like, it's not what you think, Frank, and I can explain, Frank. Despite her protests, I continued to pack my things, 
ignoring Diana's requests to discuss it. The sound of the front door slamming made me wonder where North was going. Since Diana's car was the only one in the driveway, he must have come with her. Ignoring Diana's calls to talk, I continued to pack my things, ignoring her insistence that I listen and let her explain everything. I exited the house without uttering a single word since entering the bedroom and instructing them not to halt on my account. As I made my way to my car, Diane was shouting, Wait, Frank, don't leave, please talk to me. As I opened my car door, I scanned the surroundings but found no trace of Stanton North. Perhaps he was concealed somewhere, observing, and would return upon seeing me drive away. Diane was sprinting down the front walkway and almost reached for the passenger side door handle when I pulled away from the curb. It's a miracle that I reached the airport without causing harm to myself or anyone else. My mind was clearly not focused on driving. How did it happen? Why did it happen? I would have wagered everything I had that Diane and I were solid. Reflecting on our life together, I couldn't find a single thing that would have hinted at what I had just witnessed being even remotely possible. My God. How could she have done what she did to me when we woke up that morning and then engage in what I just witnessed? Diane and I crossed paths when my father got a promotion, and we had to relocate our family 1,500 miles away. The relocation was tough on me. I was separated from the friends I had grown up with and attended school with, and thrust into a new school where I didn't know anyone. During lunchtime, I found myself sitting alone at a table in the cafeteria feeling sorry for myself when the most stunning girl I had ever seen approached me. She sat down at the table and said, Hey there, new kid. Extending her hand across the table, she introduced herself. I'm Diane. It took me a moment to realize she was offering her hand for a shake. I accepted it and replied, Hello, Diane. I'm Frank. Where are you from, Frank? She inquired, and from there we spent the rest of lunch period getting acquainted. Diane had joined me at my table because she understood what I was going through. The same thing had happened to her the previous year. By the time the bell rang, we had made plans for her to give me a tour of the town. For six weeks, we had a serious relationship. We behaved like typical teenagers. As a hormone-driven young man, I naturally wanted Diana to take our relationship to a new level. But she resisted. She was firm in her promise to her mother to marry a virgin. Fortunately, for the sake of my peace of mind, she decided to break that promise on her 18th birthday. After this significant event, we had a serious conversation. I expressed a desire to marry her, but on condition that I wait until I graduate from college. On the contrary, she wanted to get married immediately and was unhappy that I chose to wait. Discussing this issue with my mother led to an unexpected proposal. Despite the fact that I thought my mother was somewhat conservative, she suggested, why don't you move in with her and live together until you graduate? I questioned the feasibility of such a plan, citing financial problems. My intention to wait was to ensure financial stability, as I could not imagine that I would support my wife and attend school at the same time. My mother reassured me by pointing out that my college tuition fund is large enough to cover the cost of renting a small off-campus space. She suggested that I might have to work part-time to pay for groceries, but it was possible. I mulled it over and then broached the subject with Diane. After discussing it thoroughly, we both agreed to take on part-time jobs to make it happen. We searched and found a modest apartment within my budget. Then came the tough part, breaking the news to her parents. Her mother was shocked that Diane hadn't upheld her promise to remain a virgin. She wept and sobbed while Diane's father hurled insults at me, both old and invented on the spot. He outright forbade Diane and me from proceeding and insisted she never see me again. Diane gestured for me to wait in the car and emerged ten minutes later with two suitcases. She never divulged what occurred after I left, but it took three years before she spoke to her parents again, only to inform them of their grandson. Suddenly I became the exemplary partner and her parents praised me endlessly. However, the damage was done and I merely tolerated them. Diane eventually forgave them and they integrated into our lives. They were wonderful grandparents to our three children, but my tolerance remained. Years passed, the children grew and ventured into their own lives, and now this. At least the children wouldn't have to endure the pain of divorced parents. I arrived at the airport ahead of schedule, 
completed the check-in process, and then settled into one of the numerous coffee shops within the terminal to await the boarding announcement for my flight. Taking out North's wallet and checkbook, I began to sift through their contents. Tucked behind his driver's license, I discovered a card labeled Emergency Information, detailing his blood type and other pertinent details. However, what immediately drew my attention was the section containing his emergency contact information. It listed Arliss North as his contact, identified as his wife, along with a contact number. I dialed the number on my cell phone. Hello? Is this Mrs. North? Yes, it is. My name is Frank Bellows. I regret having to make this call, but I recently found your husband in a compromising situation with my wife, and I felt you should be informed. You must be joking. I'm afraid not, ma'am. I refuse to believe you, Mr. Whoever you are. My Stan would never betray me like that. Here's the plan. When he returns home tonight, ask him if he's acquainted with a Diane Bellows. Then, request to see his wallet and checkbook. He won't be able to comply because I have them. I took them from his clothes after discovering them on my living room floor when I returned home early. Currently, I'm at the airport awaiting a flight to St. Louis. Upon my return, I'll gladly deliver them to you personally. Are you completely serious about this? I'm afraid so. When will you return? I'm not sure. I need to fill in for someone who's out sick and I'll be there until they can resume work. Could you mail the wallet and checkbook to me? I suppose I could, but I should warn you in advance. Your husband's wallet contains $87, and after witnessing what I did in my bedroom, I have an urgent need to drown my sorrows with a drink, and your husband will cover the tab. There might be some money left, but I can't say how much. Send it to my office. She provided the address, and I jotted it down. Then she added, If you can send it overnight, I'll reimburse you. I can manage that. My flight is boarding now, so I have to go. I bid farewell and ended the call. North dodged a bullet. Initially, my plan was to leave his wallet and credit cards on the bathroom counter, hoping that whoever stumbled upon them would indulge in a spending spree. However, contacting his wife changed everything. I hoped she would make his life miserable. My phone had been buzzing incessantly since I left the house, mostly Diane calling, so I ignored it. It rang again as I exited the coffee shop, and assuming it was Diane once more, I glanced at the screen. Surprisingly, it was a call from the office. I returned it, and Harry answered. Frank, you need to call home. Diane just called me, frantic because she can't reach you. There's a reason for that, Harry. I'm avoiding her calls. When I went home to pack, she was there, not alone, and engaging in inappropriate behavior. I'll talk to her when I return. Maybe by then I'll have cooled off enough not to throttle her. Do yourself a favor and instruct the receptionist not to put her calls through. After ensuring that everything was running smoothly in the office and addressing any immediate concerns, my first task was to head to the post office to send Mrs. North her husband's wallet and checkbook. I included my contact information so she could reach out with any questions. With that taken care of, I contacted the police to inquire about Baker's whereabouts and if I could visit him. Upon seeing Baker, aside from some bruised knuckles and a broken finger, he appeared relatively unscathed. He hadn't undergone a bail hearing yet, as authorities were awaiting updates from the hospital regarding Smithers' condition to determine the charges. I relayed Harry's concerns and asked Baker for his account. It was a story that rang familiar. Baker had returned home during his lunch break to retrieve something he had forgotten in the morning, only to find Smithers engaging in an illicit affair with his wife. In the ensuing confrontation, Baker inflicted injuries on Smithers while his wife called 911, alleging that her husband posed a threat. Police arrived, Smithers was hospitalized, and Baker was arrested. My next destination was the hospital where I was supposed to visit Smithers. He had a lot of fractures and some problems with dignity and tools. He told me, it wasn't my fault. She attacked me first, so I defended myself. I am single and enjoy female company like any other guy. If anyone is to blame, it's Baker. If he had taken care of her properly and met her needs, she wouldn't have been looking for trouble. I had no sympathy for him. I called Harry, told him what had happened, and advised him to move Smithers out of the office unless there were grounds for his dismissal. 
I promised to thoroughly investigate the official cases to find everything that Harry could use. Baker's hearing was scheduled for the next day, and the bail amount was $250,000. He could only afford it by using his house as collateral, but his wife refused to give her consent. Therefore, he will remain in prison until his father and brother can do something about it. The following morning at 9.30, Arliss North called me. She recounted that upon her husband's return home, she confronted him about knowing a Diane Bellows. His complexion drained as he denied any acquaintance with Diane Bellows. When pressed further, he hesitantly affirmed his uncertainty. Arliss then requested his wallet and checkbook, to which he sheepishly admitted to leaving them on his desk at work. He quickly diverted the conversation, inquiring about dinner, though aware of the impending trouble he faced. The extent of his predicament remains unknown to him, awaiting revelation when I confront him again tomorrow, for his wallet and checkbook. Any insight into the duration of their affair? All I can confirm is that it occurred. I stumbled upon them, then promptly exited. What about your wife's perspective? I'm in the dark on that front. Haven't exchanged words with her since discovering them in the bedroom, and I won't until I return home. When you do speak with her, give me a call. I'd like to cross-reference their accounts. Will do. I'm eager to hear both sides as well. During the day I received a lot of calls from Diana, but I chose not to answer any of them. Harry must have informed her of my location in St. Louis, and she probably got the office number from the help desk. Dixie, our receptionist, informed me about a call on the third line, which turned out to belong to Diana. What do you want, Diana? We need to talk, Frank. I need to make it clear that what happened is not what you believe in at all. I'm not interested in talking to you right now. I'm still at the stage where I want to do something with you and then go after your lover with a gun in my hands. He's not my lover. Leave it alone, Diana. Don't call here anymore. We'll discuss this when I get home and not a minute earlier, I said before hanging up. In the afternoon, Baker's father called me and informed me that bail had been posted and Baker would be released the next morning. When I heard this news, I felt regret. As long as Baker remained in prison and Smithers was hospitalized, I didn't have to go home to face Diana. That evening, once again, I dined and had drinks at the North's place and returned to my room around seven. The phone rang, and since only Harry and Arlies North had my number, I picked it up. It was Arlies. After exchanging greetings, she updated me on her end of things. When he arrived home, I asked him again about his wallet and checkbook. He claimed they were missing from his office when he got there. He blamed someone from the night cleaning crew and said he'd file a complaint the next morning. I couldn't help but chuckle. How long does he think he can keep avoiding it? I have no idea, but I put an end to it. I confronted him about his deception. I made it clear that he knew he was caught when I brought up your wife and then asked for his wallet and checkbook. There was only one way I could have connected the dots, and he knew it. Then he had the audacity to deny knowing what I was talking about. That infuriated me, so I took his wallet and checkbook out of my purse and threw them at him. I told him exactly how I obtained them and mentioned that I called his office and discovered he worked with the woman he claimed not to know. I even fibbed a little, saying that when you returned from St. Louis, you'd show me the photos you took with your cell phone camera before they realized you were there. How did he react to that? He eventually realized he was caught and completely broke down, pleading for forgiveness and insisting it was the sole instance of his infidelity. He claimed he couldn't resist because your wife had been pursuing him for months, making it difficult to resist the advances of a beautiful woman who was eager for his affection. It's unfortunate that I wasn't more clear-headed when I stumbled upon them. I do have a camera on my cell phone, I just didn't think to use it. Do you buy his explanation? That she pursued him? It's possible. She wouldn't be the first to do so. Was it really just a one-time thing with her? That could be true, but he was lying when he claimed it was his only act of cheating. I know of at least three occasions where he strayed. Well, not entirely true. Three times I've had people inform me that he was unfaithful while I was away visiting family. I never confronted him about them because I didn't really want to know if they were true. You mentioned that his claim about Diane chasing him could be accurate and that she wouldn't be the first to do so. Why did you express that? 
Stan is quite gifted in that department, and some women are curious to verify it when they hear about it. A week ago, I would have never imagined Diane doing something like that, but that was before I caught her and your husband together. I have to leave now, but if I find out anything else, I'll let you know. Remember, I want to hear her side of the story when you return home and talk to her. I won't forget. At 11 the following morning, Ray Baker phoned me to inform me that he had been released on bail from jail. He explained that he needed the remainder of that day and the next day to attend to personal matters. His wife had obtained a restraining order against him, and he had to arrange temporary accommodation while also coordinating with the court to gain access to his house for retrieving his belongings. He mentioned that he would be back in the office on Thursday. Afterwards, I contacted Harry to update him on the situation. Additionally, I informed him that during my investigation at the office, I discovered discrepancies in Smithers' expense reports, which could potentially justify his termination. I indicated that I intended to return home on Thursday evening and would need to take Friday off to manage my own affairs, with plans to return to work on Monday morning. I successfully navigated through the following two days without any trouble, and by Thursday morning, Ray had returned to work. After bringing him up to speed on office matters, I inquired about his situation at home since I was going through something similar. He explained, The restraining order only mandates that I stay 500 feet away from her. I can enter the house whenever she's not present. If she refuses to leave when I want to enter, I have to involve someone from the court. So I waited until she went to work, then my brother and I went in and retrieved what I needed. I have no intention of going back. Expressing frustration, he continued, I don't understand what she's thinking. She got the order, but that's it. She didn't touch the bank accounts. I emptied them out yesterday. I interjected, I thought this state operated on a no-fault basis, meaning assets are typically split equally in a divorce. He clarified, That's true for divorce, but I'm not pursuing that route. I'm simply walking away. If she wants a divorce, she'll have to foot the bill, and by the time she files, our assets will be minimal. We took out a second mortgage on the house to renovate the basement, so there's no equity there, and the money I withdrew from the bank will be spent. I can argue that I needed it for my new living arrangements after she barred me from the house. Oh, and I need to call Harry to update my insurance and other paperwork. Did she explain her actions to you? I haven't had any communication with her since the police took me in, and I don't plan on speaking with her. The reason behind her actions is irrelevant. What matters is that she committed them. I opted to rest well for the night before facing Diane at home. Consequently, I contacted the airline and booked a morning flight. Upon waking up, I felt refreshed and enjoyed a hearty breakfast before catching the airport shuttle, arriving back home in Denver by 11. Afterward, I visited the bank, withdrew funds from our savings, redeemed five out of nine certificates of deposit from the deposit box, and transferred all the funds to our checking account. Diane was still at work upon my return, leaving me alone until six. Utilizing this time, I contacted the credit card companies to obtain payoff balances and subsequently canceled all but five cards. I retained the American Express card primarily used for business expenses, along with two other cards in my name and assigned two to Diane's name. Following this, I returned to the bank to arrange wire transfers for settling the card balances using the funds in our checking account. With these tasks completed, I allocated half of the remaining checking balance to open a new checking account solely in my name. Additionally, I secured another safe deposit box solely under my name, placing two of the remaining four CDs inside before heading back home. Having converted one of the kids' bedrooms into a home office and den, and maintaining the others as spare rooms for their occasional visits, I selected one of these spare bedrooms adjacent to the den for myself. After moving all my belongings, I was fully settled in by the time Diane returned home. I heard Diane enter and call out for me, Frank? Frank? Where are you? Ignoring her, I listened as she moved through the house in search of me. Eventually, she made her way upstairs and I kept my back turned as she entered. Frank? She called again, but I remained silent. Frank, 
Please, we need to talk. Finally facing her, I retorted, Where is it written that I have to engage in conversation with an unfaithful person? She flinched at my words, and then I continued, However, we do need to discuss our finances. Finances? Why? She questioned. Because your actions have necessitated changes, I replied. Please, go downstairs and take a seat at the kitchen table. I'll join you shortly. After she left, I gathered the papers I had been working on, selected the necessary ones, and followed Diane downstairs. Taking a seat across from her at the kitchen table, I began. While I was away, I had ample time to contemplate what should be done. Ultimately, I've decided to take no action. When I conveyed that message, I noticed a brief moment of relief on her face, but it swiftly dissipated as I continued. By saying nothing, I mean that I intend to have minimal or no involvement with you. Frankly, I don't see the point in spending money on divorce attorneys, especially considering my age and the unlikelihood of another marriage in my future. Therefore, I have no need for a change in marital status. If you desire a divorce, you're welcome to pursue it at your own expense. However, for now, there will be some adjustments. I proceeded to outline all the financial arrangements regarding credit cards, savings, CDs, and our joint checking account. You can keep the original safety deposit box, but I suggest opening your own checking and savings accounts. We'll maintain the joint account for household expenses. Do you follow so far? But why are you... Don't play dumb, Diane. Now, as for the household account, it will cover shared expenses. I handed her a sheet of paper. This lists the essential costs of running the household. Mortgage, utilities, phone, gas, water, sewage, taxes, and insurance. From now on, we're essentially roommates. You'll need to deposit half of the total amount listed here into the household account every month. We'll share the house, with the exception of two rooms. You'll have the master bedroom, and I'll take Carol's old room. Why are you moving into Carol's room? You should be in the master bedroom with me. After witnessing what was happening in that room, there's no chance I'm staying there, sleeping on that bed, or having anything to do with the woman I saw engaging in those activities on that bed. That's what we need to discuss, Frank. What you witnessed isn't what you're assuming. Of course it is. I saw you with another man in our house on our bed. All right, Frank. But you need to realize it was just that. Physical intimacy. There was no emotional connection. It was merely satisfying my curiosity. I love you, Frank. I always have, and always will. My feelings for Stan were purely lustful, and it was a one-time occurrence driven by curiosity. If you hadn't come home, you wouldn't have known, and it wouldn't have happened again. But, Diane, that's the issue. I did return home, and I'm fully aware of what happened. Knowing changes everything. You betrayed my trust, which means I can't rely on you. Every word you utter now needs scrutiny to discern truth from falsehood. You claim to love me. Can love coexist with betrayal and disrespect? Can you claim love while bringing another man into our home and sharing our bed? The same bed where we would have slept together? How much love and respect did you show me by offering me the leftovers of another man, knowing we could have made love that night? No, Diane, I can't trust you anymore. You say it was a one-time mistake never to be repeated. But can I believe you? I have only your assurance, yet your credibility is shattered. It could have been the tenth time already, with plans for more. Regardless, even if it were true, you still betrayed me. You violated the vows we took. What drove you to jeopardize our marriage? What curiosity was worth risking everything for? She looked away, saying, The size of his instrument. You've got to be kidding. The size of his instrument? Why on earth would you be interested in that? Some of the girls in the office met with him and they wouldn't stop talking about how great it was. I heard all their stories, but I didn't pay much attention until he started showing interest in me. Even then, it took me a while before I started thinking about it. Are you saying that he was the first to show signs of attention? I suppose it was, but I didn't pay much attention to it at first. However, I liked the attention, and what kind of woman doesn't like feeling attractive? At my age, the attention of a man ten years younger than me has significantly increased my self-esteem. I had lunch with him a couple of times and danced with him at office parties a couple of times. It was during the dance that I thought about the stories I had heard. Several times I felt him snuggle up to me, and he really seemed quite attractive to me. 
The more I thought about these stories, the more curious I became. You're the only man I've ever had a close relationship with. I wondered what another man might be like, especially one who was rumored to be as well off as Stan. He kept following me and I kept thinking, until eventually my curiosity got the better of me. So you're saying that the other girls in the office were discussing Stan's prowess in bed? How many girls are we talking about? About seven of them. So Stan had a relationship with seven of them. That's what they claimed. Are seven of them just in your office? Stan seemed to be very promiscuous. Have you ever thought that someone who had so many partners could get an infection? Come on, Frank. If it were the case, these girls would most likely have been infected by him. And believe me, word of it would have spread instantly around the office. You may have an STI without any symptoms, Diana. Sometimes it can take months before symptoms appear. If I were you, I would think about getting tested. The point of all this, Frank, is that Stan didn't matter to me at all. There were no feelings of love between us, and I can't even say that it was a lot of sympathy. This is not the impression I got when I entered the room. You know that I enjoy intimacy, Frank, and you know how expressive I can be at times like this with you. So I made a little noise. I didn't have any special feelings for Stan. It was a mistake, Frank, a serious mistake, which I deeply regret. I can assure you that it won't happen again. I love you, Frankie, you know that. You can't give up 25 years of good relationships because of one wrong step. I'm not giving up on anything, Diana. You're the one who put everything at risk by bringing another man into our house and into our bed. With that, I got up from the kitchen table, went upstairs to the office, and immersed myself in paperwork. I'm a light sleeper, and that night, about an hour after I went to bed, I was woken up by the sound of the bedroom door opening. Diana entered quietly, closing the door softly behind her. Since it was summer, I was lying on top of a blanket. Diana leaned over me and wanted something more. She always made that impression on me, but it seemed like she was trying to win back my favor with this gesture. However, I surprised her by pushing her away. Leave me alone, Diana. I'm not interested in being someone's leftover. She left the room in tears. Eventually, after about 20 minutes, I fell asleep again, and no one bothered me for the rest of the night. The next morning, when I came downstairs after a shower, Diana was making coffee in the kitchen. I greeted her with an evasive grunt and ignored her until the coffee was ready. I filled my travel mug and went to work, hardly talking to her. Later, around 10, I called Arliss North and told her what I had found. Seven other girls? That's what she claimed. Seems like your husband was quite the charmer at the office. Do you trust her version of events? Before I walked in on her and your husband, I would have believed anything she said, even if she claimed the sun was rising in the West. But now? I'm not sure. It could be true, or maybe she's just trying to minimize what happened by making me think it wasn't a big deal. Who knows? Trust went out of the window when she got caught. Everything she says now has to be taken with a grain of salt. Have you made a decision about what to do? The marriage is over, but if there's going to be a divorce, she'll have to initiate it. Right now, my plan is just to live together. We'll be roommates, nothing more. I'm not going to ruin myself financially because she couldn't keep it in her pants. What about you? Have you figured out your next steps? I'm still weighing my options. Let's stay in touch, Frank. Sure thing, Arliss. Best of luck to you. During the following week, I ensured I was out and about before Diane woke up, finding ways to occupy myself until late to avoid going home. Despite Diane waiting up for me, I deliberately disregarded her. When the next weekend came, she attempted to join me in bed once more, but I sternly instructed her to stay away and leave me alone. Frank, please don't do this to me. I love you and I want to be with you, Diane pleaded. I don't want you, Diane. You've caused irreparable damage, I responded. Oh God, Frank. It was a mistake, just once. I haven't even spoken to him since he left. Please give me another chance. I know I was wrong and I'm deeply sorry. I swear it won't happen again, Diane implored. The issue, Diane, is that I can't be certain it was only once. He could have been your third or fourth lover or even your tenth. You may still be seeing him during your lunch breaks at a motel. When I caught you with him, you shattered my trust, Diane, and I can't trust you to be truthful with me again, I explained. Please, Frank, 
There must be a way to mend things between us. I'll do anything, absolutely anything, Diane pleaded desperately. I'm sorry, Diane, but there's no chance for us to reconcile because I don't want to reconcile. Seeing you with North wrapped around him and hearing you beg for more killed any feelings I had for you. But look at it positively. You're free to explore your desires now. Just not here. This house is neutral ground. Take your partners elsewhere, and I'll do the same. Partners. I won't live without a love life. I've had opportunities, but I stayed faithful because of our vows. You broke yours, which released me from mine. At least I won't bring my affairs here where you can see. She glanced at me, and I could discern her thoughts. It was clear she believed that by sharing the house and spending time together, she could gradually reintegrate herself into my life. That's exactly what I wanted her to think. So, I resolved to burden her with a responsibility. The only reason I'm agreeing to this arrangement is because I'm not keen on enriching lawyers through a divorce, and I'm not willing to give up the comforts of my home to live in an apartment. Losing access to my garage, workshop, and patio isn't something I'm willing to sacrifice. You've got two options, Diane. Either adapt to the new situation or not. If you choose the latter, you can either move out or take over the house payments and expenses while I find another place to live. You claim to love me genuinely, so here's your opportunity to demonstrate it. Either accept cohabitation or take the house, thereby depriving me of my garage, workshop, and patio, just as you deprive me of my wife. The decision is yours. Is there any room for negotiation? I fail to see how, Diane. She remained silent for a moment, then uttered the final blow. What are your plans for the photos, Frank? The photos? The ones you captured on your cell phone. Had she not spoken to North since he stormed out of the house? How then did she know about the cell phone photos? That narrative was concocted by Arliss and relayed to her husband days after I caught Diane and North in our bedroom. No, I couldn't trust anything Diane said anymore. I couldn't bring myself to harm her physically, and ejecting her from the house would bring more trouble than punishment. However, subjecting her to my silent treatment would inflict a mental torment upon her, which was the best I could hope for. I knew she still harbored feelings for me, clinging to the slim chance of redemption, but that was never going to happen. My emotions for her died the moment I saw her with North. The longer she held on to hope, the longer my revenge would endure. With my vengeance against Diane settled, I shifted my focus to Stanton North. The findings from the private detectives confirmed my suspicions. Despite being caught by me and his wife discovering his infidelity, it hadn't deterred him in the slightest. He was still engaging in extramarital affairs with five women, in addition to his wife. During the three weeks I had the private investigators tracking him, he hadn't interacted with Diane, but he was involved with two of her colleagues. One of them, Mary Ellen Bingham, had a husband who worked the afternoon shift. Every Tuesday and Thursday after work, North would visit Mary Ellen at her home on Sunflower Way, staying for two hours before leaving. Glancing at my watch, I realized that if he stuck to his routine, he would be leaving the house in ten minutes. I was parked a block away and across the street. I stepped out of my car and approached the Bingham residence circling around behind the garage. Upon arrival, I put on latex gloves and a ski mask. Mary Ellen had a three-car garage. After North's visit, he drove into the garage, parked, and quickly closed the door so that the neighbors would not chat about Mary Ellen's guest. I wouldn't want the rumors to get to Mary Ellen's husband, would I? Using a small tire iron, I broke the lock on the back door of the garage and waited for North to appear. When the door leading to the house opened, North went outside, but was met by the gaze of Mary Ellen, who watched him leave. North convulsed on the garage floor from the discharge of a 50,000-volt stun gun. Before Mary Ellen could express her shock, I spoke in what I hoped was not a very serious tone. If you make a sound or contact the authorities, your husband will discover everything. It's best for you to return inside and act as though nothing is happening out here. I won't kill him, but rest assured, another husband he's betrayed will get justice. She recoiled and shut the door. 
Mary Ellen recognized me from the gatherings Diane had taken me to, but I relied on the ski mask and altered voice to conceal my identity from her. I couldn't risk her calling the police, so I had to act quickly. As soon as he was out of his pants, I took my revenge. He was proud of his possessions, wasn't he? Well, it was worth paying dearly for that. I did a lot of damage to his instrument. I landed a couple more punches before grabbing my wallet and checkbook and quickly running away. There were no sirens, it seems Mary Ellen did not alert the authorities. As I drove away, I considered my actions. Unsure of the extent of the damage caused by the cattle chase, I enjoyed every scream North heard. I never found out how things ended up with Mary Ellen. Had she managed to remove North unnoticed, leaving her husband in the dark? Or did she have to seek medical help for North, which led to a difficult explanation with her husband? Still wearing latex gloves, I put my wallet and checkbook in a prepared package and sent it to Arliss at her office. No note was attached and I would deny that I knew about it. And yet, when her husband in pain returns home and his things arrive in the mail, she will most likely suspect who is behind it. Three weeks following my small gathering with North, I received a call from Arliss. Are you free for lunch? I haven't made any plans. Why do you ask? I think it's time for us to meet face to face. How about noon at the Lido? I'll be the red-haired woman nervously scanning every man who enters, trying to figure out which one is you. Noon works for me. I didn't see her nervously scanning faces, but she was easy to spot as the only redhead in the place sitting alone. North was a complete idiot to be cheating on her. She was stunning. I approached her table. Mrs. North? No, Frank, it's Arliss. You haven't called me Mrs. North since our first phone call. I took a seat across from her and asked, May I inquire what led you to invite me to lunch? I just wanted to get a good look at the man who keeps messing up my life. I'm the one messing up your life. How so? You made me face the truth. I suspected what he was doing, but hoped that it was not so. Then, despite my doubts, I gave him another chance at your insistence. But then you stripped him of his greatest power. I'm not getting it. Yes, it is. Stan may be a good breadwinner and a decent father. But what made him exceptional was his skill in bed. Pay attention to the past tense. And am I responsible for removing this? How? Don't play innocent, Frank. We both know who hurt him so badly. I have no idea what you're talking about. Of course you don't want to. But since then, no matter what you do to him, he can't work, and don't pretend you don't understand what I mean. Your signature technique is sending wallets by mail. At that moment, the waitress approached to take our order. While Arliss requested a salad and iced tea, I discreetly assessed her. Undoubtedly, her husband was foolish to have stayed home. Besides being stunning, Arliss proved to be quite perceptive. Well, she inquired. Well, what? Am I satisfactory? What are you referring to now? What? You didn't expect me to notice you checking me out just now? I was caught off guard, and I knew it, so I simply grinned foolishly and replied, Who? Me. Yes, you. And I hope you like what you see because the real purpose of this little gathering is to offer it to you. I'm not sure what expression I had on my face when she spoke, but she continued. I'm a very attractive girl, and since you took the toy away from me, I think it's only fair that you take on his role. I was caught off guard and didn't know what to say. She chuckled and remarked, I bet you didn't expect this, did you? To be honest, it never occurred to me. Well, Frank, that's how I see it. You've deprived me of a partner, so it's only fair that you take his place. Besides, is there a better way to get back at your wife and my husband? I'm not sure, Arliss. The offer is tempting, but I'm not sure it's wise. If I give Diana a reason to file for divorce, it could disrupt the situation I'm in right now. You're not going to divorce her. I described my actions and she grinned. You're evil, aren't you? But don't worry. I don't plan on spreading this all over the place. If Stan does not regain the right to use his equipment, I will divorce him, and I do not want him to have grounds for a counterclaim. Are you serious? You bet. That's how my affair with Arliss North began. This has been going on for over a year now, and there is no end in sight. 
Her husband's instrument is still not working. Doctors say there is no physical cause, so it's most likely a psychological problem. Carly's plans to stay with him until the end of the year, and if he still can't perform, he's out. As far as I know, Diana is not dating anyone, but she knows that I am dating. She just doesn't know who she's with. The realization that I'm with someone else eats her up from the inside, but she keeps holding on, hoping for a miracle that won't happen. I couldn't have asked for a better revenge.